This is the RZen Post of the Week podcast, kind of unedited and unrefined, mostly, where we talk about a Zen Reddit post or don't of practical or academic interest. Um, this is the series within the series where we go over the most famous book of Zen instruction in human history. And I think we're on case three. And our guest will introduce themselves and uh, I guess talk about the post uh the case the something all right go ahead yes hi i'm astromi and here's the case it's case three i'm reading uh one of the curious translation of the woman one i think jc carry um and this is translation it's uh whenever he was questioned master judy would just hold up a finger Later, one of the boys in the congregation was asked by an outsider, what is the essential teaching of your master? The boy also held up a finger. When Judy heard about this, he took a knife and cut off the boy's finger. As the boy ran out howling in pain, Judy called him back. When the boy looked back, Judy just held up a finger. The boy was abruptly enlightened. When Judy was about to die, he told the congregation, I got Tianlong's one finger Zen and used it my whole life without exhausting it. As his words ended, he died. Did we, I actually just thought of something. I have no idea. I have never thought of looking this guy up. Do, do you know if we have other things about him? Like, did he really never say anything else? I do not know of any other records about him. Okay. 356. So there's one some talks about him in the Book of Serenity. I just want to check really quickly. Uh, okay. So, um, Chan Master Judy of Jinhua Mountain in Wu province first lived in a hut on Mount Tiantai. There was a nun named Chi Yi who arrived with a rain hat on her head and a staff in her hand. She circled Judy three times and asked, if you can speak, I'll take off my hat. Three times she asked, but Judy had no reply at all. Chi Yi went away. Judy said, it's getting late. Just stay for the night. She said, if you can speak, I'll stay. Again, Judy had no reply. After Chi Yi had left, Judy lamented to himself. Though I am in the body of a man, I don't have the spirit of a man. He was about to abandon his hut to go traveling to study, but that night, the spirit of the mountain told him, you don't need to leave the, this mountain. There will be a great bodhisattva who will come explain the Dharma for you. Uh, ten days later, Tian Long arrived. Uh -huh. uh, Judy welcomed him, bowing to him in all sincerity and recounted the foregoing events to him in detail. Tianlong raised his finger and pointed at him. Judy was greatly enlightened on the spot. Okay. It, it's, so it's, it's really just one finger Zen. Okay. Okay. I don't know why I doubt, why I doubt it. I didn't learn anything from the show. Okay. I, so the commentary from woman is, uh, where Judy and the boy were enlightened was not on the finger. If you can see it into this, then Tianlong, Judy, the boy, and you yourself are all strung through on the same string. And the verse says, Judy made a fool out of old Tianlong, holding up the sharp blade alone to test a little boy. A little boy. The great spirit lifts his hand without much ado and splits apart the million layers of flower mountain. With what? The great spirit lifts his hand without much ado and splits apart the million layers of flower mountain. Uh, Blythe and uh, T. Cleary have run through with the same skewer. Uh, I don't know what that is. Give me one sec. Oh, like a thing that you cook things with, right? Like um. Yes, exactly it? that. Yeah, you know the thing. So, 
So, uh, is this a is this a complicated case? I mean, what's 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 the Flower Mountain reference? Uh, 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 I'm not sure. I'm going to check if, oh, I lost it. Um, nope, no idea. Uh, I Googled it and then this is what it says. The traveler on the Yangtze River steamer passing from Wuhu to Nanking will see about midway between these two cities the 25 miles from the and 25 miles from the southern bank a long range of mountains with unusually sharp rugged peaks the highest points of which are probably not over 5000 feet above the Yangtze Valley the original name for this range was the Nine Suns but in the Tang dynasty the celebrated poet Li Pa made the observation that nine peaks were shaped like lotus flower like a lotus flower and hence it was called nine lotus flower mountain the whole in the whole range there are 99 peaks the most conspicuous of which are and there's names for all of them that's nine lotus flower mountain is there another flower mountain Flower Sermon. Let's ask Blythe what he says. Does he have a comment for us? Okay, here we go. Some commentators take this verse and the preceding commentary as expressing woman's adverse criticism of Judzi and say that just as the boy imitated his master, so Judzi imitated his master. Again, they say that the chopping off of the finger was an unnecessary and barbarous act condemned by the powerful action of the mountain spirit, who, according to Chinese tradition, divided the mountain with a mere touch of the hand and allowed the waters of the Yellow River to flow between them. Well, I I think that's that's a good uh, thing to talk. Uh, we could talk about because I think most of the time, what um, what's really uh, notorious about Zen masters. No, wait. Notorious is a it means something else. Give me one second. Um, the thing that stands out with Zen masters, right, is like I don't know. You you think of uh, Zhao Jiu, and he has all of these, you know, um, clever answers that are mostly are different uh, each time, with except when they're not. And I think it's interesting to talk about that because I think part of what Judy, or however that's pronounced, um, brings to the record is that it has nothing to do with the cleverness, right? And the uh, the creativity that I don't know. I think a lot of people associate with, uh, like, I think a lot of people who like the Japanese Buddhists, like that their answers are, you know, they don't understand them and they talk about nature and they are uh, pretty answers. But I think this is so different from that. And, it, and it's even different uh, within uh, the Zen tradition because... How did 
like I think that's that's kind of what a, what astounds me. How do we not have any conversations of uh, anybody else being like, you know, asking him about the finger? Like, do you have anything else to say? Uh, I, I don't know. Why would people come and stay at a monastery where the whole teaching was just a guy with a finger? Right. And that's, uh, it seems like maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, I also want to pref, I also want to, I intended to preface this conversation by saying, I don't think he cuts off the guy's finger. I've said this uh, a bunch of times, but um, we have in the 1400s Ming Ben appearing in portraiture, missing the last joint of a finger. And there are references to uh, a Chinese tradition of burning a finger or cutting the tip of a finger off in order to uh, emphasize or um, uh, create a permanent reminder of a vow or obligation. Uh, so uh, I think it is reasonable to say that, um, you know, monks burned their finger or they cut off the tip of their finger when they took a vow or intended to take a vow. Um, this would not be this. Th this may have something to do with uh, Zen master Yang Shen cutting off the um, parts of a finger on each hand in order to get out of uh, farming so that they would send him away to become a monk. Like the story seems to be he cut his fingers off so they wouldn't make him do manual labor. But I think it's equally likely that he cut the tips of two fingers off to show them how serious he was about being a monk. So they released him from his familial obligation and sent him to live at the monastery. I mean, if you've got people cutting off body parts, they're they're not getting around, right? Um, but like the cutting off of the arm story and that the second patriarch supposedly did, we we know that's not what happened, right? Nobody can cut their arm off and then go about their business, and <laughs> and cutting off an arm is just a huge amount of work. But if there's a tradition of burning or a finger or cutting off the tip of a finger, in, um in China and the second patriarch cuts something off, I think it's pretty reasonable to conclude that it was in fact the tip of a finger and that the case has been distorted by translation since then. Like we don't have any other, we, ha we have lots of other examples of this fingertip cutting. We don't have anybody else cutting off an arm. The language used to describe fingers, hands, and arms is very closely bound up. So I'm, I'm okay with it all being just fingertips. But the question then becomes, right, is Judzi forcing the uh, young monk to take a vow? Okay. Uh, I just want to say also that... Uh, I <laughs> okay. Okay, that that's a, that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, okay, so it also reminds me of uh, this guy uh, from the 49ers. He was a safety at the time, I think. His name was Ronnie Lott. And the guy injured his pinky while playing. And they were like, well, you have a fractured pinky, so you're not playing for the rest of the playoffs. And he was like, but I, I need to play the uh, for the playoffs. If you take my finger off, can I play? And so he amputated his uh, the tip of his pinky, right? And I don't know. I, I like to me, it sounds kind of the same. Like it, like if you cut the tip of the finger or you cut all of the finger, like I, that's a big deal. Um, and about taking the vows forcibly, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know why. Like, 
isn't the point of the of a vow that it's uh, voluntary? Is it? I don't know. Um, citizenship generally is not seen as voluntary, right? So that's a pretty wild comparison, right? I mean, people expect you to go and be in your country and fight for your country, and there's not a lot of voluntariness there. Right, but um, okay. So if okay, I think I guess that depends on the on the vow, right? And I don't I don't know what kind of I, I don't know if, if there's only the one vow that people can make or if they are a lot of. Uh, different kinds of vows. I think to me, that's too hard to speculate on, but I, I don't have a lot of information. Uh, I, I don't understand. Are you saying that there, you're saying that there's a lots of different kinds of vows? Like, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that Judzi made him make a particular vow, but that the force of the case is about teaching things you don't understand. And that moment is something that the mo young monk won't forget. I mean, it's going to be a permanent part of his life now. In the same way that a vow is supposed to be a permanent part of your life. Okay. Okay. I, I, I get that. I also want to say that of the translations I have, one of them is by Thomas Cleary. And he, he writes several pages on this case about Buddhist magic spells. And it's all complete horse poop. I mean, it's. It's absolutely not scholarly or academic. I mean, it's just writing about his, his personal faith. It doesn't have anything to do. And so when we talk about like, I mean, Thomas Cleary is one of the most important translators in this conversation. So to have him just be completely insane is a pretty big deal. And no, I mean, it is a big deal. And I think we have to, you know, always remember that um, translators are, are, not Zen masters. They're, they're not even particularly well-informed sometimes, as Cleary's rant on magic spells in Buddhism can attest. And I think that um, you have to be willing to push back on the text, and that's a huge advantage for Westerners, I think, because um, if, you know, if you know not to trust the translator, it's a very short step to not trusting whoever is providing, you know, where, trusting the original source of the text. And I think that one of the problems is, especially with this book by Wooman, is that people want him to be somebody that he isn't, and they try to recast his words to make him appear like those people, um, as Blythe has pointed out. And uh, I, I don't think that that's reasonable or acceptable. Um, Wooman says... Enlightenment, which Judzi and the boy attained, has nothing to do with a finger. If anyone clings to a finger, Tenryu will be so disappointed that he will annihilate Judzi, the boy, and the clinger altogether. Totally different translation by reps, but um, it's a warning by woman, right? And even in Thomas Cleary's version... Uh, the skewering of all three people is a threat, right? You're killed by the skewer. Now, of course, we can talk about dying in Zen, but it's, you know, it's a warning. As opposed to, 
you know, the JC Cleary you wrote, which sounds more like money on a string. I think also when talking about um, translations, uh, I think it's also fair to point out that um, a lot of the translations we have of texts, do, like, I, I don't know, it, it seems to me like the clearies uh, mostly uh, uh, mostly translate and then comment as two sort of different jobs, right? It I haven't bumped into them using what they want the text to say to translate, right? So uh, I, right, I don't think is, that, that that's why this this translation by Thomas Cleary is so weird. Because he just like goes off into this crazy place, and we don't normally see that. I mean, we see that kind of thing with Yamada, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other part is, I think, um, I, I don't think this is what the case is saying, uh, or or the only thing the case is is uh, can communicate. But I think it's also an interesting question uh, to think about what it means to learn from someone in the Zen tradition. Because uh, <laughs> it's very funny. Because uh, Judy takes the one finger Zen that Tian Long did, uh, which I I heavily suspect that Tian Long just did it that one time, um, and uh, Judy just ro uh, rolled with it, right? Uh, his whole life. Yep, that's uh, right. He he does this one finger send for whoever comes to ask him a question, whoever uh, you know comes to uh, uh, sticking uh, instruction, whatever, and. When someone asks his, I, I guess, student or whatever, the, the boy that was staying in his community, uh, what he thought, uh, it, right, that was the, the, the case, right? They ask him, uh, what is the essential teaching of your master? And the boy does the thing that you does. Um, I think the reason that is shocking uh, is because it's because of of what of of what woman says in his comment, right? That it's not about the finger per se. And okay, so what I'm trying to get with this is, I think it's a fair question to pon to ponder what thing that people are learning from Zen masters is and if it can be uh, done uh, if it can be done away with am I saying that wrong um, it also reminds me of uh, when someone asked some guy if Yao Yo uh, was teaching uh, that Yao Yo's teaching was the oak in the garden and the and the guy was like, my teacher never said such a thing. How dare you? Um, which is kind of the, the opposite of what's happening here, right? Um, because yeah, you did say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think it's diff it's different. Like, I don't know if we can make the argument that everything that Zen masters are saying it's a teaching. You don't think we can make the argument that everything Zen masters say is a teaching? I think, okay, let me, let me, it's a, it's a hard point to make. Um, 
Okay, no, okay, okay, I, I got it. I don't think people know what a teaching is. So that's part of the problem. So when Zhao just says, uh, someone asks him, uh, I think, what is Buddha, right? And Zhao Zhu uh, says, the oak tree in the garden. I think people hear that. And a lot of the time, the teaching that they are trying to take for, well, first of all, they think they can take it for themselves, right? The the answer, uh, Zhao just answer. Um, but then they also misunderstand what Zhao Zhu is doing. Like I, I remember there was a guy in the forum, I don't know, about a year ago or something like that, who thought that what the Zen masters were doing was just uh, replying with whatever they were uh, getting to their sense data at the moment. Like, you know, you ask me a question and I'm like, there's a chilly breeze or I don't know, uh, the, the sun is coming to the curtains and that's all he did. And I, I think it, I don't think we can blame we can blame Yaoyo for that or Judy for that matter. I think it just it's a misunderstanding about what it is the Zen masters are exemplifying or demonstrating by doing what they're doing. But the the particular thing that 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 they're saying or doing is not like a, like a, I don't know like a talisman you can you know keep close to your chest and be like yes this protects me against spirits and whatever and i'm just gonna keep this forever questions um, uh it doesn't protect you against questions and it doesn't protect you from doubt it's a useless medallion <laughs> i i was thinking uh because uh, people are angry uh, that I haven't read Hakuin. That, no, wait. People are angry that I don't have to ha to have studied Hakuin for I don't know however many years, or even read him with particular care in order to know that he's not a, he's not a Zen master. And I think it all basically comes down to. They like this guy for some reason. I, I have a feeling they, they like this guy. They do not like this guy. Trust me. I read <laughs> the guy. He's an idiot. Hakuin is an idiot. And his writing is horrible. His a whole... It's a scam. And it's like people saying, look, if you don't read the Book of Mormon and you don't study the Book of Mormon in a Mormon temple, then you can't criticize Mormonism. I mean, no. I mean, if you say <laughs> that you have talked to Jesus in the Wild West or that, you know, you have the answers to all these riddles that no one ever asked, then you're just an idiot. I mean, it's not a problematic thing. Um, I think the way that I am going to approach the thing that you're saying about teachings is either everything that they say and do is a teaching or none of it is a teaching because it is just demonstration. The problem is that demonstrating is teaching. <laughs> so the, the, the idea about, I mean, really what we want to know is what teaching is in various contexts. And in the West in particular, there has long been an argument about book learning versus real life experience. And in, in, in the trade professions where it matters, like you don't want a plumber who just went to college and looked at plumbing in, in books, you know, uh, and the reason for that is that textbooks suck, right? Um, if the textbooks were all written by plumbers who were currently working in the industry, it would be a very different thing to criticize book learning. Um, but because 
Western educational institutions tend to rely on books written by people that don't necessarily have practical experience of the topic. You get this division between book learning and practical experience. And on top of that, we have lots of professions where because the stakes tend to be high, ironically, doctors and plumbers, there's a period of time where you study under someone who can supervise your work. And arguably, that's not book learning or real life experience because you're constantly being supervised, right? Your work is being checked and that so the stakes are different. So there's all this complication about what teaching is and what demonstration is. But I, having said that, uh, want to jump back. Uh, that was your eight minute warning. Uh, Blythe says that there are several versions of this case and that as usual, Wooman has used a uh, an abbreviated version. And so, yeah, yeah, that's, and it's not the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as you know, from, uh, from the uh, Jojo not have Buddha nature case, he, he just used, right. I, I'm fairly sure he knew about the rest of it. Um, but he can do whatever he wants, right? Um, so here's the beginning of the longer version of the case. One day, Judzi, having hidden a knife in his sleeve, said to the boy, I hear that you understand what Zen master Buddha's dharma really is. Is that so? And the boy replied, it is so. And Judzi said, what is the Buddha? And the boy stuck up his finger and Judzi cut it off with a knife. So in this version... It's a complicated trap that's been laid, right? It's not like, you know, they're just hanging out one day and, you know, he ninjas him with the knife. There's a, it's a, the, no, there's a, there's an interview ahead of time, right? And then the knife comes out and it was hidden in his sleeve. So it's clearly premeditated, right? Um, so it's interesting that woman doesn't give us that version. It's always interesting when woman doesn't give us the longer version. Um, I think it's it's funny that it it sounds to me like uh because woman's version makes it sound like the boy just did it and you know the the knife cutting happened right but this one makes it sound like probably the boy did it uh Judy heard the boy did it and he asked him again like he I don't know if it can if it can be uh, described as he gave him another opportunity, <laughs> but he did have another opportunity, and <laughs> I think that that's just really funny. Um, but also, um, it reminds me of uh, I guess we'll we'll get to that one as well. But it reminds me of uh, when Nanquan had the cat and he asked people to give him a word of zen right um and i think there's a lot of i think there's a lot of wordplay when it comes to cases like this but i think it's fair to describe cutting a cat in half and taking away someone's finger with a knife as violent things, right? It's it's a it's a violent action, right? And I don't think it's too um, speculative to say that in those moments, uh, the people we are dealing with uh, angry Buddhas, right? And I think. It makes sense, at least uh, from from what I understand, that they are angry because, I mean, they they live with them, right? These people are there, uh, they're working, they're there uh, to learn from the Buddhas. They are, you know, studying twenty four. Well, I mean, maybe not studying twenty four seven, but uh, at least uh, studying a, a part of the time and working and. Uh, introspecting and talking to each other, talking to other students of Zen all the time. And I I, I don't know, it, it sounds understandable to me 
that if if all the boy has learned from Judy about what a Buddha is is to do the same thing that he's doing, then I I understand I understand him being pissed off at that. I, I mean I don't know if he if he was, but I think it's understandable. Uh, uh, there was a guest on the podcast once who was just dropping by and didn't have a post to discuss and I proposed that she look at the famous cases list and then we would talk about it and she said that it was surprisingly violent and I think that that's I don't think it's a surprisingly violent list to people who study Zen and have heard it all before, but to Westerners, especially people who think that Buddhism is a nonviolent religion um, and think that Zen is part of Buddhism, it can be really disorienting. And one of the interesting things to me is that we don't see that kind of disorientation in other places in the Zen record, right? We, they, don't talk a lot about how barbaric or unfair it was that the finger got cut off. Hundreds of years go by, and maybe we get one or two objections about the cat, but I'm not aware of any objections about the finger. So it's a very interesting thing to try to see these cases in the context of the society that they came from as opposed to Western society. Um, there's a movie on Netflix right now which lovingly makes this point in a very vicious way. Um, it's called, um, oh, I, I can't even tell you what it's called. It's a comedy horror movie about a, a teenage girl who travels back in time from now and arrives in the 80s. And there's all these jokes about how much modern teenagers suck and how the 80s suck. And you get these jokes by slamming the two cultures together. At one point, um, a school bully uh, th throws her out of a party that she attends that she was not invited to. And she yells, unwanted touching, unwanted touching. And, <laughs> and the whole room looks at her like she's crazy. And in the 80s, it would be crazy to say that, right? Mm -hmm. And we can say, well, that's because the 80s were a barbaric time when women weren't respected. <laughs> But at the same time, yelling unwanted touching is is a bit ludicrous to everyone from the 80s. Like, it's beautifully ridiculous at both sides, right? And I feel like a lot of people want to engage with Zen's history as if they don't have to ever time travel. Like, they don't ever have to be in that context. So they can say anything that they want to other people whose reaction might be you know he cut off his finger that that's unwanted touching i think yeah i think if if someone has never studied any history like at, at, at any level then it makes like there are so many things we don't know about so many stuff like uh <laughs> in order to understand like um like any literary text, uh, uh, and you can see that right in in the uh, in the book of Serenity, for instance, with how much explaining one song has to do, and uh, just in order in order for us to start the conversation. Um, and he was explaining that to people who were his contemporaries, for whom the history was less than three hundred years old, and they all spoke Chinese, and they'd all grown up in the same country. <laughs> that was he's he doesn't think it's going to be read by english people a thousand years later he's writing that for other chinese people right i think it's uh i mean i think when when it's 